Hi, my name is Lauren Huntsman, and I'm a certified student loan planner and certified financial planner here at WealthNest. A big obstacle I have seen impact my younger clients are student loans and how to juggle and contribute to the rest of their financial priorities. In fact, some 44 million Americans collectively hold over 1.6 trillion in student debt, and these numbers are growing. People have been repeatedly told that their best chance of getting ahead was to seek an advanced education, whether through academia or by upgrading or retraining in vocational skills. The result? Teenagers not even old enough to buy an alcoholic beverage legally are now signing up for life-altering amounts of debt. So how do we fix this problem? How do borrowers get ahead and be able to contribute to their net worth and financial household while paying back sometimes monumental amounts of debt? To answer these questions, we first have to understand how we got here, the financial and tax tools at your disposal, and what the higher education industry will look like for our future generations. Student loans for college are largely a creature of federal intervention. Decades ago, politicians decided that it would be good to have more people go to college, and they created a system of grants and subsidized loans to make that possible. As we have learned, government intervention nearly always has unanticipated consequences that create the apparent need for still more intervention. That is exactly what we see when it comes to higher education and its financing. Before World War II, the federal government had virtually nothing to do with higher education. It had no regulations that colleges and universities had to obey, and it paid for no one's college attendance. Occasionally, it commissioned some scientific research from professors, but otherwise, it played no role. In fact, for much of American history, college was for the elite. If you couldn't afford it, you didn't go. Only a small percentage of the population pursued college studies. Most people didn't think it was worth the cost. In 1919, an estimated 598,000 students were enrolled in American colleges. While historically black colleges and universities and historically women's colleges have existed since the 1830s, the majority of American college students remained wealthy white men for decades. Things changed with the passage of the GI Bill in 1944, since that law provided, among other things, that returning soldiers would be eligible for federal grants if they enrolled in college. Many took advantage of that subsidy which would ultimately send nearly 8 million World War II veterans to college. And thus, the government's interventionist course was set. Almost immediately, the heads of colleges realized that this new revenue source could be tapped endlessly. To keep up with demand, the government added the College Scholarship Service, a prelude to the National Defense of Student Loans, which later became the Perkins Loans Program. On top of this, policymakers provided a carrot to encourage schools to enroll former soldiers by setting the tuition reimbursement far higher than even Harvard charged in order to encourage schools to raise fees. Lawmakers hoped that these higher rates for everyone, but only covered by the federal government for veterans, would bankroll the campus expansions needed to accommodate both the tidal wave of GIs applying as well as the increasing demand from civilians who rightly understood higher education to be essential for their futures. The GI Bill certainly helped many veterans, but it also made higher education less affordable for everyday citizens whose mounting requests for aid sparked much more direct investment in higher education after World War II, but only at the state level. This brings us to 1958, when the Cold War brought fears the U.S. was technologically falling behind. The tensions continuing to rise between the U.S. and Russia and in response to the Soviet launch of Sputnik, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act, which offered students scholarships and loans to go to college to help ensure that highly trained individuals would be available to help America compete with the Soviet Union in scientific and technical fields. The Soviet Union now has, in the combined category, category of scientists and engineers, a greater number than the United States. And it is producing graduates in these fields at a much faster rate. Recent studies of the educational standards of the Soviet Union show that this gain in quantity can no longer be considered offset by lack of quality. This trend is disturbing. Indeed, according to my scientific advisors, this is for the American people the most critical problem of all. My scientific advisors place this problem above all other immediate tasks of producing missiles, of developing new techniques in the armed services, we need science 
in the 10 years ahead, they say we need them by thousands more than we're now presently planning to have. Following the Cold War, Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty led to the Higher Education Act of 1965. Grants were now given to students based on their income, which dramatically expanded the opportunity to receive the college education to students other than what was at the time primarily white men, adding to other legislative gains achieved by the civil rights movement. The Higher Education Act also established the Guaranteeing Student Loan Program, also known as a Federal Family Education Loan Program. This allowed banks and private institutions to provide government subsidized and guaranteed loans to students. This paved the way for greater access to college and enrollment grew while costs remained low. The HEA did a lot to continue higher education's storied post-war expansion. Between 1954 and 1974, growing federal support helped multiply the number of community colleges, enabling almost every state to develop at least one new public research university and triple the student body, which included a growing number of women and minorities. Both Congress and the White House had hoped HEA's lending program would also jumpstart a student loan industry, which seemed a far cheaper way for the federal government to finance university expansion. Increasing earmarks for schools and students had also coincided with rising out-of-pocket costs, and on the other hand, there were escalating demands for less spending than taxing, including for education. The real sea of change occurred in the 1970s, when the economy stagnated, inflation soared, economic inequality increased, and tuition rates skyrocketed. Taxpayers revolted. This tumultuous time would foreshadow one of the most important and pivotal times for education in the 1980s Reagan era. So during the Reagan era and the tax revolt of the 1980s, states passed tax and expenditure limitations. No federal program suffered deeper cuts than student aid. Spending on higher education was slashed by some 25% between 1980 and 1985. In raw dollar figures, Cuts told $594 million in student assistance and $338 million in Pell Grants. Students eligible for grant assistance freshman year had to take out student loans to cover their second year. For middle-class families, eligibility was changed as well. Low-cost, low-interest, subsidized federal loans were limited to families with household incomes of less than $32,000, regardless of the family size. Because of this, state budgets became under threat. And so states that used to highly subsidize a college education for many people started to cut back in various ways, either by raising tuition or by spending less. Plus funding and student aid available, college costs boomed as a result. The College Board estimates that during the 1980 to 1981 school year, it cost students the modern equivalent of 17410 to attend a private college and 7900 to attend a public college. This includes tuition, fees, room, and board. By 1990, those costs increased to 26,050 and 9,800 respectively. And I'm the one who will not raise taxes. My opponent won't rule out raising taxes, but I will and the Congress will push me to raise taxes and I'll say no, and they'll push and I'll say no, and they'll push again and I'll say to them, read my lips, no. Elected officials up and down the ballots took notice. It evinced in Reagan's landslide 1984 re-election and George H. W. Bush's eventually broken promise of no new taxes in 1988 that there would be no electoral consequence for cutting higher education spending. In fact, voters were far more likely to punish lawmakers for raising taxes. Elected officials made the political calculus that it was safer politically to divert existing funds from discretionary costs to mandatory costs like health care, prisons, and primary education than to raise taxes. So this brings us to 1992 and the Higher Education Act amendments that resulted in a significant expansion of the federal student loan program. Up until this point, all federal loans were subsidized, meaning that the government absorbed the interest while students were in school. With the Higher Education Amendments of 92, the federal government began to offer unsubsidized loans to all students, regardless of their financial need, as long as they were enrolled at least half-time at a qualifying institution. These amendments also created the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, also known as FAFSA, and a pilot program for income-sensitive repayment. As costs grew, lawmakers scrambled for new solutions to expand access and cut costs for the government. In the early 2000s, President George W. Bush promised a series of tax cuts to stimulate the American economy and put an end to the recession. A year ago, tax relief was said to be 
a political impossibility. Six months ago, it was supposed to be a political liability. Today, it becomes reality. It becomes reality because of the bipartisan leadership of the members of the United States Congress. And they're trying to save for really honest college education. The Kennedy's tax cut in the 60s and President Reagan's tax cuts. Tax relief is the first achievement produced by the new tone in Washington. And it was produced in record time. This was materialized in June of 2001 when he signed the Economic Growth and Tax Reconciliation Act. During his second term, President George W. Bush signed yet another law to help student loan borrowers. With the Higher Education Reconciliation Act, graduate students became eligible for PLUS loans. These loans have higher interest rates than other federal loans for graduate school, but they do allow students to borrow up to the total cost of attendance. Also signed by President George W. Bush, the College Cost Reduction and Access Act of 2007 resulted in several major milestones. The act pledged to reduce interest rates over a five-year period and increase the Pell Grants program funding by $11.4 billion. In addition, both the Income-Based Repayment Program and the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program were born to make student loan repayment more manageable. This made it a lot easier for online education to grow, and that affected a lot of large for-profit institutions that expanded their enrollment in the mid-2000s. Put some numbers to that, from 2000 to 2010, Enrollment in private for-profit institutions increased by 329%. Then, in December of 2007, the financial crisis hit. Federal and state governments made deep cuts to higher education funding. Many states made massive cuts to funding at public universities, which again caused many of these schools to raise tuition in order to recoup the lost revenue. As the labor market weakened, more and more workers looked to higher education as a lifeline. Public and private college enrollment spiked and many were forced to turn students away. But for-profit colleges welcomed these students with open arms. From the start of the financial crisis in 2008 to the relative economic stability of 2018, college costs and debt increased significantly. The state and federal funding for higher education, which is the biggest source of revenue for most schools, has not returned to pre-2008 levels. In 2018, state funding for two- and four-year public colleges was over $7 billion less than what it was in 2008. During the 2019 to 2020 school year, the average cost of tuition, fees, room, and board was at around $21,950 for in-state, $38,330 for out-of-state, and $49,870 at private nonprofit universities. At the same time, the median wealth of middle-income Americans has stayed flat for years at about $87,140. So that brings us to the year 2020, when the coronavirus pandemic changed the entire landscape of student loan repayment and refinance. In unprecedented fashion, President Trump signed the CARES Act on March 27, 2020. Among other provisions, this law granted temporary relief to borrowers by placing all federal student loans on administrative forbearance interest-free. Although payments were scheduled to restart that same year, borrowers got six more extensions, with the latest one approved by President Joe Biden back in April and set to expire on August 31, 2022. The Biden administration has also made substantial changes during the past year to federal programs to bring more borrowers closer to forgiveness. These include expanding borrower defense, removing taxes from any forgiven balances until 2025, automatically waiving federal student loan interest for service members, and automatically forgiving debt for disabled borrowers. So today, August 24th, President Biden has announced the final COVID-era legislation. 10,000 forgiven for qualifying federal student loan borrowers and 20,000 forgiven for federal student loan borrowers who are Pell Grant recipients. A qualifying student loan borrower is any student loan borrower making under 125,000 or under 250000 as a family. This long-awaited announcement will help relieve 43 million Americans and effectively pay off the total remaining student loan balance for one-fourth of student loan borrowers. This payment pause has also been extended one final time through December 31, 2022. Furthermore, this move comes after the Biden administration has approved nearly $32 billion in loan discharges for Americans in which most of this covered borrowers who were defrauded by their colleges. Some may wonder, why is such a long wait in coming to a decision, especially after being promised that they would receive a decision well before the repayment deadline of September 1st? Likely, the Biden administration weighed the potential gain of encouraging young and minority voters less than three months before the midterm election, while also considering the risk of fueling inflation. 
With inflation as hot and sticky as it is right now, after printing trillions of dollars in COVID economic policies and stimulus, the $50,000 in student loan forgiveness never seemed like a viable option. So where do we go from here? One of the most pertinent aspects of the new student loan forgiveness is each student loan borrower and taxpayer's income. The Education Department has said around 8 million borrowers are likely to have their loans forgiven automatically since the agency already has their income on file. For others, it sounds like there will be a simple form to upload it to verify your income. More details will be released over the coming weeks. However, for those who are on a tax extension or still need to file their 2021 tax return, it's of utmost importance to collaborate with a tax professional and make sure you are utilizing all of the tax and investment tools at your disposal to lower your adjusted gross income if you are close to those income limits. So very similar to the COVID stimulus checks, forgiveness for those who need to fill out the form will most likely be based on your most recently filed tax return. The number your gov the government looks at at your adjusted gross income, your AGI, and if it's under the income ban restriction. Furthermore, it's important to remember that this is not the first student loan forgiveness set in place. Current income-based repayment plans do end in forgiveness. So before the rescue plan of 2021, the balance you had left at the end of your repayment term, plus take to say 25,000, is taxable on your tax return as ordinary income. I tell my clients to think of them that having 25,000 extra as taxable income they need to report in the year, even though that 25,000 wasn't something they actually received in their pockets. This is usually when I get the, oh my God, Lauren, that's ridiculous, which I agree the student loan industry as a whole has its issues. However, paying your marginal tax rate on 25,000 may mean you owe an extra 5,000 compared to paying back the full 25,000. But to circle back to the rescue plan enacted last summer, if you are in an income-based repayment plan and your loan end date is before December 31st, 2025, your remaining balance is forgiven tax-free. And will they extend this past 2025? I mean, your guess is as good as mine. But this stresses the importance of working with a tax professional who can help minimize your current taxes and your adjusted gross income so you pay less on your monthly student loan payments and can be proactively planning your financial future whether your total balance is forgiven or not. So I leave you with this. I would argue that tax planning is just as important as investment planning. I would argue that government intervention usually leads to more problems that require more government intervention. But the one thing that is constant is change. The ability to change your future through education, the ability to change your financial future by making smart, proactive decisions, no matter your student loan balance, and the constant change of the tax code. So if you have any questions regarding your tax, financial, or student loan plan, feel free to reach out at the links below. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.